and welcome everyone to Science Unwrapped. My name is Brynja Kohler. I'm a professor in the Mathematics and Statistics Department. And as of September, I am Associate Dean of Undergraduate Programs and Services in the College of Science at Utah State University. So I am extremely honored and very happy to introduce Science Unwrapped tonight and to welcome you all. I see lots and lots of inquisitive minds um, out in the audience. And the purpose of Science Unwrapped is to really reveal the excitement and wonder of science. And um, we have uh, top-notch scientists from Utah State University and from other places sometimes as well who come to share that joy and excitement with science, of science um, with all of us. So I'm going to be introducing our speaker tonight, give you a little bio about her, and then she's going to give us a talk. Um, and and uh, uh, I'm very excited for her presentation. There's going to be some audience participation. After that, um, uh, for those of you who've done these before, you know that there's activities. We've got lots of different booths with hands-on activities and opportunities for you to explore science and talk to scientists. Um, uh, but somehow in between there, there will also be some questions and answers session with, with our speaker tonight. Um, so you can kind of help me because I'm new to this. <laughs> Keep on track with that agenda. But all right, welcome everyone. I want to give a quick shout out to all the Science Unwrapped um, committee members, Eric Fowler, Brennan Bean, Melissa Kofed, Blair Larson, Boyd Edwards, and of course, Marianne Mifletto, who's the College of Science PR special specialist, because um, they've done really all the work of um, organizing our series this year. And our series is, of course, about building on basics. So scientists have been telling us about the fundamental principles of, uh, of science and how they're uh, seen in different fields. All right. So let me now introduce our speaker tonight. Dr. Evie Ganaway Dalton is being welcomed tonight. She's a faculty member at Utah State University Eastern in Price, Utah. The USU Eastern campus is located in Carbon County near the northern section of the San Rafael Swell and is home to some of Utah's breathtaking rock formations and unique scenic landscapes. It's truly a geoscientist's paradise. The USU Eastern campus also houses Utah's renowned prehistoric museum. Evie is an assistant professor in the USU Department of Geosciences. Her areas of research focus are sedimentology, stratigraphy, and tectonics. She grew up near Memphis in western Tennessee and spent vacations with her parents and siblings camping in the Great Smoky Mountains and eastern Tennessee. It was during these outings that Evie developed a love of nature. Evie attended the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee. And she and her siblings have the NCAA record for most siblings playing the same sport in the same school. That, that, sort, that sport is soccer. Um, and she'd probably correct me and say, well, they're tied with some other brothers at Harvard who all played the same sport as well. But still, it's the number one most siblings playing the same sport at the same school. Um, she started out majoring in English, but then during a geology class, she fell in love with science and changed her major. Um, after completion of her bachelor's degree, she was selected as a Fulbright scholar and went to the Technical University of Munich in Germany, where she studied geological sciences for a year. Evie went on to earn a master's and doctoral degrees at Geological Sciences from the University of Texas at El Paso. Evie joined USU Eastern in August of 2020 and says she was very excited to move to Price, Utah. Evie lists Paradox Basin in southeastern Utah as her favorite part of the state. 
She says one of her favorite parts of teaching is introducing students, many of whom have lived in Utah all their lives, to the state's unique geological wonders. Evie and her husband, Charlie, who's here tonight, um, who's a Spanish teacher and a fiber artist, enjoy exploring Utah's outdoors with their dogs, Honcho and Archie, and they like running, skiing, and exploring Helper's fascinating art scene. Okay, <laughs> let's welcome Evie to the stage. All right. I did turn that on. Okay, good. Um, I'm also very loud, so there's no problem with that. Um, welcome. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, I'm going to talk to you about how we use uh, fossils, fossils here in particular in Utah, um, to tell time in Earth's geologic history. So the first, I'm going to go ahead and just put you right on the spot and ask you a question. What is a fossil? First hand up. Okay, a bone that's turned into rock. What else we've got? Something that shows us what has lived in the past. In the very back. All right, man, y'all have, have crushed that. So, yes, we have fossils are evidence of ancient life. Okay, so. Fossils can be uh, the remains of organisms like animals. Um, we've got all kinds of, okay, this is going to take some getting used to. You know, we've got our dinosaurs and ammonites and trilobites and other different animals. It can also be plants, right? We've got some plants. Um, fossils can also just be the remains of an organism's behavior. Any ideas what this is? It is indeed poop. It is fossilized poop, coprolite. Don't worry, I've got some that you can touch if you so dare. All right, so a, a piece of evidence of a, 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 an organism's behavior um, that tells us something about them. So what then do fossils tell us? What can, what can a fossil tell us? Let's go for a new hand and then we'll come back here. What life was like a long time ago, absolutely. Did somebody give you the cheat code for tonight's talk? Okay. Yeah, good job. It can tell us how old they are. What else? Okay, sounds like I don't, don't, don't need to give this talk then. So, um, absolutely. Okay, so fossils tell, can tell us how old these rocks are. What else can they tell us? Oh, absolutely. They tell us about our past and they tell us about our future. Yes. So these are all examples of what fossils can tell us. They can tell us, you know, how organisms lived in the case of, you know, the fossilized, oh, wait, the fossilized poop. They can even tell us what they ate. In some cases, they tell us how we died, right? This little guy died in, tr in tree sap that turned into amber. Right? So fossils can tell us about what the landscape was, what the environment was. Um, I should have begun this talk by telling you a, a secret, sharing a secret with you. I'm not a paleontologist. And that's a person that studies, I know, it, shocking. That's a person that studies fossils. Instead, I am a sedimentologist and stratigrapher. So I am just someone who gets to use fossils that I just so happen to love. Basically, the benefit of this is I don't have to worry about learning the Latin names to those fossils. So um, fossils for me, as a sedimentologist, they tell me what environment that sedimentary rock uh, was deposited in, wh where it formed. Um, so for geologists, these ones that already know the, uh, the talk tonight, um, fossils can tell us how we tell time in geology. So when we're thinking about Earth's history, um, we generally have kind of two tools that we use as 
uh, geologists to tell time, we have relative dating and we have absolute dating. So relative dating is where we're just putting things in order from oldest to youngest, okay? Um, absolute dating is, is where we're actually putting a, a, a number, a numerical age on rocks or events. And um, that's obviously, you know, really great, but for a long time, we didn't have those tools as geologists to be able to, to accurately determine absolute dates. And so early geologists used relative dating to come up with an understanding of geologic time and Earth's history. And even today, we've got a lot of rocks out there that we can't use absolute dating methods on. And so relative dating, using in particular fossils, um, is still really important. So, as we go on today, we're going to explore uh, Utah's fossil record. So a fossil is, is as, as I said earlier, just evidence of ancient life. And we can see Ut or, excuse me, Earth's fossil record, kind of depicted up here, basically a bunch of, of firsts in the, uh, in the record book in terms of, you know, first animals with shells, fish, first amphibians, first reptiles, etc. And this is a depiction of the principle that we're going to talk about today, which is the principle of fossil succession. That might be somewhat daunting and scary. Don't worry, I'm going to help you get through it. Fossils, um, or, or excuse me, this principle, this principle of fossil succession basically means that groups of fossils succeed or follow each other in time, okay? So what that means is, um, for those of you that, that you know, have, uh, have been paying attention to, to England lately, we've had the succession of, uh, the, of King Charles after the death of his mother, Queen Elizabeth, he was next in line. So that is the succession. He has followed her into uh, the crown there. Um, and groups of fossils that we see in the rock record follow each other in time in a predictable and unique manner, regardless of whether we find them. So we can use fossils that we have here in Utah to be able to say that our rocks are older or younger than fossils anywhere else on the world or around the world which is a pretty powerful, powerful tool. So, to give us an idea of how we do this, we're gonna play a game. So I'm gonna need uh, a couple of, well, like at least a dozen or so volunteers before, <laughs> love it. Um, I'm gonna need a wide range of ages, okay? So give me a dozen or so volunteers and I need some, some, some young folks, I need some old folks and I have no idea how to, to choose. That's great. Come on up. You get, you get to play. You get to play. <laughs> okay, okay. Very good. All right, all right, I think that's good. So, what I need you to do, here I'm gonna get out of your way, what I need you to do is we're gonna play this relative dating game, okay, where I want you to get in order from oldest over there on that wall to youngest over here. But here's the thing, you cannot say your age, okay? So, you can talk about your life experiences, your, you know, your, your, hair, your habits, your teeth, whatever, you cannot say your age. You cannot say when you were born. Thank you. Good caveat. You can say your grade. Yep. You can say your grade. That's fine. What's that? Nope. No mention of your age. No mention of your birth date. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, by height? That's a good idea.
All right, I think you're, I think you're doing, doing, yep. Yeah, okay, all right. We've got a big cluster of folks right here in the middle. We got some folks over here, our youngest. Somehow my husband got brought in to volunteer. He's the oldest, good, all right. Okay, so uh, what, what, what did you use to put yourselves in order? Grade, okay, grade. Well, but we're not using our age, remember? So, yeah, so oldest down there, youngest down here. What else besides our grade? Yeah, our height. Facial hair. Okay. Or lack of hair, either way. He's, you know, sorry. Thank you for being a great volunteer. Okay, so probably height. You know, we've got some little, little folks over here. We picked all of these different traits that, uh, that differentiate us, right? That, that make us different from one another. <laughs> Y'all are doing great. So what you have done is, is very much like what uh, paleontologists do to determine the relative order. They look at traits. They look at traits of, of the fossils that basically tell us uh, whether those fossils are primitive or ancestral, like, like that guy over there, or whether they are advanced or derived, like this one over here, who's one, gay, one day going to be able to you know, teach us how to, I don't know, do something crazy on the computer that he definitely can't do, right? <laughs> All right, so... Our primitive or ancestral traits are those that are shared by many different organisms. The uh, organisms that are, are the, the traits that establish a common ancestry. It's basically like it's us having a backbone and our dogs having backbones too, right? We're both vertebrates. But we have advanced traits. We can walk upright and we have thumbs, okay? Opposable thumbs. I've recently become mildly obsessed with getting a, a VW van. And, uh, and so this is another way we can look at this, right? We've got the classic, oh wait, classic over here. And we've got the, uh, the, the new and improved model, the, the soon to be released electric van. And they both share tires, steering wheels, you know, engines, but this new and improved model it's got, uh, it's got cruise control and, and power steering and, and an electric engine instead of a, a combustion engine. So we're seeing primitive traits shared by both and advanced traits only in this new and improved model. And we use those different traits to basically do what we just did here, put ourselves in order even if we don't know the age. Thank you all, wonderful volunteers. Especially you. Now, for, for an example that's a little bit more relevant to, to us in our discussion of, of different critters, we have, for instance, um, we can, can look at fish, right? On the left, we've got a, a primitive uh, jawless fish, like a hagfish or a lamprey. It's got, it's got uh, you know, it can swim, it's got gills just like our very advanced um, goldfish here, but our goldfish has a jaw, it has bony fins, things that make it more advanced. Do you have a question? Yeah, don't we also have like primitive traits, like appendix or something? Yes, appendix like the, uh, that we don't need, right? I don't, I don't know too much about that one. I still have mine, that's all I know. Okay, so how does this apply to our principle that we're talking about? Well, we're going to go over to England for a little bit um, to learn about the kind of the, the discovery of and, and, and formalizing of this principle with um, an Englishman by the name of William Smith, who was working for a coal company in the late 1700s, early 1800s, um, all across the British Isles, and was basically being tasked with finding layers of coal. And he recognized from, from some other principles of geology that, for instance, um, he knew that the older rocks in a stack of rocks, the older ones were on the bottom, the younger ones were on the top, even if they were kind of tilted on his side. But he also noticed 
that when he looked at the fossils, they also showed some differences in each of these different layers. And for instance, the deeper he went, the older rocks he went, the f more strange or unusual or, or, or less like the living species those fossils were. So it's kind of like seeing our, our classic VW van at the bottom and our, and our new one at the top. And so he used all of this information to ultimately to put a whole uh, map of, of the British Isles. It's kind of the first time this was ever put together um, and, uh, and was really the first and uh, most detailed geologic map that existed out there in the world. But, but he was really interested in those fossils. And so he basically made that the rest of his life, um, ultimately actually sending him to debtor's pr prison in, while doing it. Um, but what he did was basically go through all of the layers that he found around England and documented the different fossils that he found. And he noticed that, you know, yeah, we've got snail shells, we've got teeth, we've got clam shells in both sets, right? Clam shells, teeth, and snail shells but they look distinctly different and that you did not find them mixed up and together, you only ever found them in those little groups. And so that basically formalized this idea of the principle of fossil succession that we could use to uh, determine the age if we knew what fossils were in it. So that started our geologists on, early geologists on subdividing Earth's history based on major changes in the fossil record, major turnover in the fossil record. And, um, and that's basically the, the, the first appearance of, of new organisms and the first disappearance, or in the, the disappearance of, of old ones, right? Um, and, and so the life that you get in these rocks ends up being um, how our geologic time scale in Earth's history is subdivided. And so we can see the first big break signaled right about there on our little graphic on the right-hand side. And you'll notice that all of the rocks below, there's nothing in them. All of the rocks above, full of fossils. All right, so that differentiates or that separates um, the older uh, time period in Earth from a younger time period in Earth. I like to, it was mentioned that, that I thought I was going to be an English major. Um, so I like to think of Earth's history in, in terms of like my favorite book series. And in this case, it's a four-part book series, and we're going to skip the first two because there's no life in it at all. We're going to move to the third because that's where the stuff gets good. And these books are our eons in, in Earth's history. So this is our, our big breakdowns. And <clears throat> the, we have, <clears throat> where is my, there it is. Okay, so we have, um, this is the boundary, this arrow here is the boundary between those two books where we have um, the older book is known as the Proterozoic and the younger book is the Phanerozoic, and that's actually the one we are living in right now. And so those names come from the life that is in them. In that Phanero in means visible, and Zoic means life, okay? And as we see that depicted on this graphic, where <clears throat> in the fossil record, that is where we see the first appearance of tons of life, hard shells, things that, that make really good fossils. As we'll see in a little bit, it was eventually discovered that there was actually life in that previous book, and so that became known as the Proterozoic, or former, earlier life, but it's, it's really small and, and really hard to find. Then we take our book of the Phanerozoic and we divide it up into chapters. We've got three of them um, that, again, get their names from life. So we have the Paleozoic, or ancient life, Mesozoic, or middle life, and Cenozoic or recent life, okay? So <clears throat> these are then defined first by the appearance of life that starts our Paleozoic, and then death, then big mass extinctions that end the Paleozoic, starting the Mesozoic, and then end the Mesozoic, okay? So we're going to see here, uh, just kind of another representation of this, where on the, the, the bottom here, we've got geologic time going from, from oldest to youngest, left to right. 
And, and then on the, the, on the side, on the y-axis here, is basically number of organisms, but number of different types of organisms. And so we see, we start off in the Phanerozoic book, the, the Paleozoic chapter, and we get tons of new life, and we start this steady climb towards the diversity that we have, this amazing diversity that we have today, but punctuated or kind of interrupted by some dips, right, where, where basically the number of organisms all of a sudden drops off really dramatically. So those are mass extinctions where we lose tons of organisms in the fossil record. And those kind of bookend the Mesozoic to continue the, the theme of books. Okay, now geologists aren't the only one that use this principle. Um, this is actually really important for uh, Charles Darwin and his uh, eventual uh, discovery and, and ideas surrounding what would become the theory of evolution. So we can see his, uh, his famous um, tree of life sketch here where he's seeing like how all of these different um, organisms over time are related to one another. And the fossil record provides evidence for that theory. Basically, the fossil record is evolution trapped in those rocks, for instance, where we see in older rocks our fish, in younger rocks only our, or, excuse me, in older rocks only fish, in younger rocks we start to see our amphibians, and in rocks in between we get transitional organisms um, that are basically fish moving on to land. Whew, okay. Let's see now what Utah's fossils tell us. Because um, I don't know if you all know this, but Utah has some of the best fossil, or uh, one of the best fossil records of, I'd say, pretty much any state. So here's our state. Here we are. Where are we? There we are. We're up in Logan. You can find yourself if you're not, if you're not from here. I'm, you know, down in Price. Um, now what I've added, all these blue dots, these are fossil sites around the state. Bigger the dot, the darker the blue, the more fossils that have been collected there, okay? And then all of these different colors that you now see on the screen are all the different ages of rocks that we have in Utah, which is basically the full gamut, okay, from um, the Proterozoic Eon all the way to now, and that's where we're going to start. So we are going to start in that time period of you know, former or earlier life of the Proterozoic Eon. And, uh, and so these, these pink rocks that you see up there in the Uinta Mountains, which you can see a little bit better now. And you'll see here in just a second why for a long time we didn't think there was any life in these rocks. And it's because it is tiny and microscopic and, and really, really simple. But we now recognize that it's actually really important. Um, and so here is just some, some random, or not random, <laughs> several different um, little tiny, so we're going to need a, a big microscope, high-powered microscope to be able to see any of these guys. These are cyanobacteria and algae and other microbes, basically like pond scum that you see um, today. And you can see why it might be kind of difficult to, uh, to identify that life. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, for, <clears throat> for the sake of, of saving all of our eyes from squinting at that for too long, let's look at the visible life, right? The Phanerozoic Eon. And so we can see we got no shortage of, uh, of layers or of, of rocks from that age here in Utah. And we have the entire chapter of the Paleozoic um, preserved here in Utah. I'm going to highlight just the very beginning and the very end because that's the good stuff in my opinion. Um, so we're going to focus on the House Range over in western Utah and the Wellsville Mountains just off to our west here. And here we have a little snapshot of the very beginning of the Paleozoic that is, it, it rivals um, where this kind of uh, understanding of the beginning of the Paleozoic, this all comes from, from Canada, but our rocks here of the House Range and the Wellsville's actually, actually rivals that um, and is proving to be really important. And man, these guys were weird. That's the only way to think about it, okay? So the beginning of the Phanerozoic 
eon or book and the Paleozoic era, um, that begins with this kind of explosion of life. Not a literal explosion, right? But a, a figurative explosion of all kinds of new different creatures that were really trying to figure some things out. I mean, this is not a normal body shape um, by any stretch, stretch of the imagination. And you can see by the, by the Latin name, neither you know, the discoverer of it thought that they must be hallucinating to get that uh, strange creature. Some of these, we don't even understand what they are. Like this guy over here on the right, it's just, it's an enigmatic or you know, an, a, a not understood soft-bodied organism. That's, that's as much as we can say. So these are part of uh, what we call in geology a Lagerstaten. It's a German word um, for, for mother load. So it's basically fossil deposits where we have just really um, incredible preservation, including getting soft body parts that normally make terrible fossils. And we get tons of different types of fossils. And as I said, the kind of First understanding of this was in Canada, but our Lagerstaten here in the state um, is nearly just as good. And we've got samples down here and I think also some outside for y'all to check out. Um, in particular, we've got samples of these guys. Anybody? Trilobites, Tri -bites, absolutely. And, and you can see they were also kind of getting, they were experimenting too. They were, they were going kind of crazy with their body shapes. You know, some had tails, some had, had uh, spines. This one, you know, basically has a head that looks like its butt. So they were getting very um, creative. And that habit of trilobites makes them really good index fossils. It makes them really unique and really easy to identify. And so an index fossil is, is basically an organism, um, a species or genera of organism that provides really precise ages of rocks. And for instance, it's what lets us say that rocks of the house range down in western Utah and of the Wellsvilles right here, 200 miles apart, but because of the trilobites that are the same in both places, we know those rocks were formed at the same time, that they're the same age. <laughs> All right, so we're going to fast forward through the rest of the Paleozoic to get to the good stuff because I know I've got some dinosaur fans in the house. And so we're going to run to the end of the uh, Paleozoic where we have our first mass extinction. And this was a big guy, so big that we actually refer to this as the great dying. Um, so 96% of life on Earth, or excuse me, 96% of life in the ocean and 70% of life on land is estimated to have died during this mass extinction. And um, while that is, you know, a bummer for them, it sets the stage for this chapter of the Paleozoic era to close and our next chapter, the age of reptiles and the Mesozoic era to begin. And that is where Utah really excels. This is the meat of our fossil record comes out of the Mesozoic. And so we could basically pick anywhere we wanted to here and talk about these fossils. We're going to focus on kind of southern and eastern Utah, though, um, and I'll give you some highlights. So life in this, I, sh I, should, uh, I should preface this by saying because of how much cool stuff, cool fossils we've got in this time period, um, I'm also going to take a little bit closer of a look and look at the paragraphs here, the periods, beginning with the Triassic, where basically life is recovering from the great dying. And we've got these kind of Star Wars-esque Star Wars looking creatures that are running around or flying around on land here in Utah. So we've got a, a phytosaur, a freshwater le reptile up at the top, kind of resembles, but is actually not related to a crocodile. Um, and then um, on the bottom, we have a flying reptile that would have been haunting our skies, a, a pterosaur. Um, and I particularly want to highlight this one because this was just recently discovered in, um, in Dinosaur National Monument. And its name, that I'm not even going to try to pronounce in Latin, means heavenly wind, which will make a little, little bit more sense when you find out that the quarry where it was pulled out of is called the Saints and Sinners Quarry. Um, so very appropriate. Um, and this is also a really cool um, kind of new technology that's being used in paleontology where that's actually not a fossil. That's a 3D print of a fossil. 
So the bones here are so delicate that they can't take them out of the ground. So instead, they've done a CT scan, and they have 3D printed that skeleton while they wait to try to figure out how to get them out without damaging them. Pretty cool. Um, OK, who's here for the dinosaurs? Yeah, I had a feeling. OK, well, here it is. So the Jurassic and Cretaceous, our next paragraphs in this chapter, are where our dinosaurs really feature, and, um, and in particular here in Utah. So uh, just to bring your attention to where we find these guys, Jurassic dinosaurs on the left, Cretaceous on the right. So we've got Jurassic National Monument down near Mir and Price, or Dinosaur National Monument um, near Vernal. We've got also in the Cretaceous, all kinds of dinosaurs coming out of Grand Staircase, Escalante, as well as Utah Raptor State Park, which is just north of Moab, and they just broke ground on that, um, I think, a few weeks ago. So that'll be a, a new state park for us here shortly. So what do these dinosaurs look like? We have big dinosaurs during the Jurassic, really big dinosaurs like our Allosaurus. Anybody know the claim to fame of Allosaurus? What is it? The T-Rex evolved from it. Okay, the T-Rex does evolve from it. It is also our state fossil. Okay. Um, at that time, we also would have had all of these big long-necked dinosaurs like Apatosaurus and Camarasaurus. So Allosaurus, if you go to, this is at the, at the, the Jurassic National Monument, and the quarry there is basically 80% bones of Allosaurus. That's like all it is, and there's tons of them. Um, what's really cool, I think, about this one is that this Camarasaurus is still in the ground, in the quarry wall at uh, Dinosaur National Monument. Brilliant way to preserve a dinosaur, put a roof over it, leave it in the ground. You can go see it yourself. All right, in the Cretaceous, we get really diverse. So we get our raptors, including Utah raptor. We've got so many dinosaurs, we don't just have a dinosaur as a state fossil, we also have a state dinosaur. That's Utah raptor. Um, so this is on display uh, down at USU Eastern Prehistoric Museum. And of course, this is a more accurate representation of what is depicted as a velociraptor in your Jurassic Park movies that would have been actually the size of about a turkey. But Utah raptor is, is actually what they're depicting there, or what is more accurate there. I guess it just didn't have quite the great, as great of a name as velociraptor. I think it's pretty cool. Um, that we have multiple dinosaurs named after the state, including also uh, some horned dinosaurs like Utah Ceratops, so one of many horned dinosaurs that we have in the state, and you can go check out all the different horns and their crazy frills and all that kind of stuff at the, the Natural History Museum. And everybody knows Tyrannosaurus Rex, right? So I thought I would instead highlight his great uncle, Lythronax argestis that was just discovered fairly recently. That name means Southern King of Gore. I think that's pretty, pretty accurate, right? Now, lest I, you know, it, I don't want you to think that it was only dinosaurs, particularly in the Cretaceous, part of Utah was actually covered by a, uh, an ocean and um, that was not just covering part of Utah, but, but much of the western interior um, of the U.S. and full of creatures like this, ammonites. And these are, you know, different shapes and sizes, some bumpy, some smooth, some with, with real tight lines, some real broad. These are another example of a great index fossil that we've got here in Utah that lets us, for instance, tell that the fossils on the top that come out of the tropic shale down in, near Grand Staircase, and the fossils on the bottom that come out of the Mancos near me and Price, those were actually this part of the same sea because they come out of the same, uh, not just the same paragraph, not just the same sentence, the same word in that paragraph. And feasting on these guys were our big marine reptiles like mosasaurs. Um, <clears throat> and you'll forgive me if I brought in actually a... Uh, a, uh, a, a reptile from uh, the Mancos exposed in Colorado, but that's because it hangs in the museum at BYU, and uh, this was the PhD focus of the USU Eastern Paleontology Coordinator, so it's a er, uh, curator, so it's got a lot of Utah connections and probably swam back and forth across the state line back in its day. All things must, all good things must come to an end, and 
The Mesozoic also ends a mass extinction, this time due to a giant asteroid impact like six miles wide that's going to kill 70% of life on Earth, including all of our dinosaurs, or at least our, our non-avian dinosaurs. Um, and it was just looking for dino worlds, so, you know, what can you do? But I really wanted to highlight this because this is a, a, a evolving research project that, that um, myself and the, the aforementioned paleontology curator, Josh Lively, at the USU Eastern Paleontology or, uh, Prehistoric Museum are beginning where this event is really well known from places to the north of us, Wyoming, Montana, not so much here in Utah. Um, and so we have started in the very early stages of this project where, for instance, we've gone to the Utah Geological Survey and looked at some core that was collected uh, by a coal company back in the 80s. And, you know, me, the non-paleontologist, my attention was drawn to these cool little clamshells. I turned it over. Lo and behold, it's got a dinosaur bone in it. So we asked the state paleontologist, James uh, uh, Kirkland, that was there. It's the first time he knows of that a, that a bone has been hit by a drill core. Um, and based on where it is in that sequence and, and where we kind of think the boundary is, this could be one of Utah's last dinosaurs, um, which, is, which is pretty cool. Um, whew, all right. Our final chapter, the Cenozoic era, um, recent life. And for that, we're going to look at uh, ancient Lake Uinta that um, sits kind of between uh, Vernal and Price. Man, I'm really, this new clicker is, is weird on me. Um, it sits between, between Vernal and Price, and then, of course, places all along within the Wasatch Range. And at the very beginning of this chapter, um, Utah, much of Utah, Wyoming, Colorado, was part of three really big lakes that um, had tons of really awesome organisms living them that would eventually become the Green River Formation with fish, eating fish and dying. We have fish, so that's this guy, right? He's dying because he's eating another fish. We've got uh, big fish, uh, you know, basically just all of these fish dying at the same time. But we've also got uh, birds, there's other places with mammals. Here in Utah in particular, we've got really delicate plants and insects, things that just normally don't make good fossils. So we have another one of these Lagerstaten. It extends all the way into Wyoming and Colorado, so if you've ever been to Fossil Butte National Monument, that's part of this as well, over the border in Wyoming. There's countries out there that don't have multiple Lagerstaten. We get two for our, our state which is pretty incredible. And the last critters I want to tell you about are the big weird ones that lived during the last uh, ice age that was here in Utah thousands to a few millions of years ago. So of course, across Utah, much of western Utah, we had Big Lake Vonneville, also covered uh, much of the, the area here in Logan, and, and haunting those shores would be these giant megafauna, basically huge um, mammals like our giant ground sloth here, our saber-toothed cat, or sort of the pride of the USU Eastern Prehistoric Museum, this Columbian mammoth, um, probably the most important fossil we've got in our collection um, that they found when they were digging uh, the dam, or making the dam for the Huntington Reservoir um, up in the Wasatch. Um, so come on down to Price and, and check that out um, and see kind of all of these different organisms that would have covered our landscape at that time, um, including even some of our very own ancestors as well. With that, I want to say thank you and thank you to the Science Unwrapped Committee and to you for your enthusiasm and any questions? Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to actually just take a few minutes if we could do this for those of you who are eager to just, who don't want to participate in question and answers, you can get up now and go out and go see some of those hands-on activities that are out in the hallways. Um, but we'll have a question and answer session here. So just with a quick two-minute dismissal.
we have this. So it seems like there's these uh, big mass extinctions where the big creatures die off. Are those also, are they always associated with some massive die off or are there periods in prehistory when the big things just kind of evolutionarily weren't selected for and that weren't so devastating? Gotcha, yeah. Actually, um, yes, absolutely and in fact, if I can go back, these guys. So they did not, they went extinct um, in sort of a unexciting fashion, not part of a mass extinction. Um, part of the end of the ice age, there's kind of debates about whether it was uh, due to climate and the changing of the climate that basically made them you know, useless at that point because part of the idea of them being so big is that they, um, you know, had a lot of body mass when it was cold and that kind of thing and that changing climate maybe made it played a role or we see there is, you know, man the hunter and that's also kind of thought of um, to have played a role in, in that extinction as well um, and probably different in different places is kind of what they're coming out to, to decide. So yes, there are instances in um, throughout the, the history where, um, you know, less, there's still extinctions, they're just not considered mass extinctions. There's a, there's a number of, like a percentage of numbers of species that had to have gone extinct for it to qualify as a mass extinction, um, but there are, you know, uh, numbers of, of or, uh, lots of times where we don't reach that threshold, but lots of organisms have still died. What's your favorite dinosaur? Oh, I should have I should have known this was coming. Um, my favorite dinosaur is probably Edamontosaurus. It's a duck bill dinosaur. I didn't talk about it today, but like Ducky from Land Before Time. If you've ever seen that, probably that guy. Why do the bones turn to rock? What's that? Why do the bones turn to rock? Why do the bones turn to rock? That's a great question. So um, fossils or organisms become fossils when they get buried in sediment, sand, gravel, clay, things like that. And then over time, those bones are, you know, from a living organism, they basically, the, the, the bone gets replaced little by little by little minerals until eventually you've lost all of the bone, all of the organic material that makes our bones, and it's a rock. Well, because they get buried. They get, yeah, science. Um, they get buried, and then uh, when they're buried, the temperatures start to get higher, and uh, fluids are moving, like water and things are moving through there, carrying different elements that, Decide, hey, I'm gonna go swap out for you and turn you into a bone or turn you into a fossil. Okay. Is that better? All right, we got a question back here. Okay. So this is a bit of an unrelated question, but <laughs> it is about fossils. Okay. So I saw a fossil of a, a dire wolf that was approximately the same size as my dog. Was that their actual size? Oh man. Um I don't know much about dire wolves. I thought they were bigger. Um, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> maybe that's a good question. Is it, you Actually, know, it's is a it a dachshund? Not sure. I'm sorry, I, I'm gonna have to look that one up. <laughs> a baby dire wolf baby? Oh, it's good, yeah. The mic is coming. It looks like a giant dice, or die, I guess, singular. So, uh, is the rock composition of a stromatolite rock different from other rock? Yes. So, a stromatolite, well done. So a stromatolite is a very primitive fossil 
and some of the oldest fossils that we have out there. It's basically, you remember I described um, the cyanobacteria and algae or pond scum? That's basically what a stromatolite is in like a big bulbous, like mushroom shaped thing. And usually it is made out of the mineral calcite, um, whereas a lot of these other bones are in, and so that calcite makes a rock into limestone, whereas a lot of these other bones, some are in, in, in uh, some of these fossils are in limestone, but a lot of them are in sandstone or shale, so yeah. I need to talk to you later. <laughs> Stromatolites are one of my favorite fossils, I think. Do you all have one question or three questions? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Do you think dinosaurs were more of a reptile, or do you think they were, looked more like birds? Well, they are reptiles. Dinosaurs are a type of reptile. Um, so are you saying, do they, did they look more like reptiles, or did they have feathers? Is that were the question? Like, could you tell if they were a reptile? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can tell they're reptiles. They've got um, the characteristics of reptiles in terms of um, basically having their, their, their legs under their body instead of like an amphibian whose legs are out here. Um, they've got the right number of digits, like on the fingers, on their toes. But they probably did also have um, feathers. I mean, we, we definitely, you saw a picture of the Utah raptor. Um, they definitely had feathers. Um, and and they, those dinosaurs eventually you know, evolved into birds. So they definitely shared some characteristics. So scientists are trying to bring back like the mammoths and stuff. Can you like explain just a little bit the process of that? <laughs> or? Have you ever seen Jurassic Park? Um, I, oh, I, I am afraid I cannot. Um, I think the general principle is that they are trying to uh, take pieces of DNA from the mammoth and basically put it into the most closely related living organism, like an African elephant or something like that, and that's where they would go. Um, but that's as far as my, my knowledge goes. All right, last question to the <laughs> most patient. Okay. Um, how come did the um, um, dinosaurs technically evolve their features? How did they do that? I don't know. How? how? Yeah. Like um, well, I mean, adaptation by basically what works and what doesn't. And so the things that work stick around, and the things that don't work, they, you know, like our appendix, we're going to lose it eventually, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Let's give another round of applause to thank Dr. Danaway Dalton. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for coming. Um, don't miss next month in November, we're going to have um, Dr. Tanya Triplett from the Physics Department at Utah State University. She's going to introduce us to radioactivity as the next in our Ooh. Building on Basics series. So, yes, please go out. There's lots of cool hands-on activities at booths. Please stay and enjoy, and don't forget there's also cookies. Um, and we'll um, stick around to yep. more one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, with anyone who wants to talk more about fossils. Thank you. Thank you.